fact, let me start with the geography because South Africa and its development, like most countries, if you look at Italy, it's exactly the same. In the North, you have a lot of engineering in the South less. South Africa is an island nation. So I'm trying to give you sort of strategic lenses for analyzing a country. What the geography of South Africa says, of course, as you know, it's at the bottom of Africa. Uh, people migrated here from the center of Africa a thousand or more years ago and moved with their cattle and built their communities coming southwards. European uh, um, occupation happened in the 1600s and uh, first the Portuguese and then the Dutch and then the British. Like much of Asia, these superpowers competed for these resources. Cape Town was originally a a, a, a petrol station on the way to Asia, because that was the primary form of navigation. Two thirds of our coastline is sea, and there's nothing near us. So we're quite an isolated country in a way, and that has a lot to do with our approach to things. Our neighbors are very small and weak. They, they mostly dysfunctional polities, Mozambique or Swaziland or Lesotho, Zimbabwe, a couple of fairly well-functioning polities, Namibia and Botswana, but we're surrounded by very small neighbors who present no sense of rivalry. Um, it's a bit like the US having Canada and Mexico as its neighbors. Uh, they're around, but they're not really strategic, not like France looking at Germany all the time and wondering when they're going to cross the border again. It's a big country. It's got about six or seven climates a long coastal subtropical climate. Cape Town is this little spot of a Mediterranean climate, which means it rains in the winter. The rest is summer rainfall. It's dry in the west and it gets increasingly uh, more rain as you go east. So in the inland is semi-desert and in the far west is desert. Um, it was an agricultural country. It was a colony and then Africana trekkers, people from Dutch descent moved inland um, because the British forbade slavery and their economies, as crude as they were on the farms, was based on slavery and they wanted their independence. They moved like the Americans, they moved inland. They created two republics. Then the things changed when diamonds were discovered in Kimberley. It was the first town in the world to have electric lights and uh, this great source of wealth produced a big mine. It's a, like a big swimming pool. And they made fortunes out of that. And Cecil Rhodes was the prime minister and the Elon Musk of his time. In 1886, gold was discovered almost by accident in the middle of the felt, as we call it, in the middle of the Transvaal, about 400 kilometers north of Kimberley, about 1400 kilometers from where I am. And in six years, Johannesburg overtook Cape Town. Uh, there were 800 wagons a day. It's a typical Wild West story. There were massive deposits of gold, and that's what changed South Africa's destiny. Because foreign capital came in, mining engineers came in, miners came in, labor was needed because the gold was deep underground. We built engineering skills, we built a big banking system, and South Africa from 1886 until fairly recently could be described as a a mining country with gold as the core mineral, which then became coal, iron ore, platinum, precious metals. And we really, if you look at the 20th century, have been a, a, a mining, a mining, uh, a place for, uh, in our post-colonial history, a place for multinationals. So we have all the big multinationals here, big car industry, auto industry, but mining was the rump of the South African economy. So that's just a little bit about the geography. I'll talk more about the people in a minute. What was the history? I've touched on some of it. So it became uh, four countries, uh, but like Latin America in some ways, it were finally amalgamated. The British wanted control of the minerals, so they created a war as they do from time to time. And uh, they invaded uh, the Transvaal where the gold was. And that led to a fairly bitter, fierce war because these Afrikaners, these Boers as they were called, were in 
incredibly good fighters and very good marksmen and very well armed. And uh, they, they gave a big hiding to the British military, but it led to a four year war. And at the end there was a peace treaty. And then in 1910, the British consolidated South Africa into the union of South Africa, largely autonomous. Um, we were part of the Commonwealth, but we were autonomous. So uh, that's just a little bit of the history in the sense that uh, because of the, who the people are, uh, there's been a lot of racial conflict that you all understand and know. And these Afrikaners, the white community was about 12% of the population. We had a big migration of Indian people who came in the early 1900s. So we have a sizable Indian community in one part of the country mainly. And then we have a big mixed race, think of Brazil uh, community that came from relations between black and white South Africans. Black South Africans come from multiple ethnic groups. They speak slightly different languages, but they're all part of the same broad ethnic group and called Unguni or Bantu. And uh, they are in two main groups, Zulu and Tosa and then smaller groups. And they're very interesting because their cultures are all adapted by geography and slightly different. The Zulu Wars you may have heard of or watched the movie when you were a kid. That was again, the British wanting to get control and the Zulus gave the British a big hiding. And then there was the Anglo-Zulu War in which they were overthrown and, and dominated and oppressed. White South Africans set about a policy called apartheid in 1948 the Africana working class government won the white elections. There were only ever white elections. And they imposed and legislated apartheid, which is what I grew up with. This form of racial oppression, which was legal, administrative. Uh, when I arrived in Johannesburg 45 years ago, there was not a single black executive managing a white person, not one. And this segregation was harshly enforced. Um, we lived in separate communities, domestic workers worked in homes, young men came to work on the mines, were not allowed to bring their families, they created dormitory societies. Uh, it's very hard to describe the degree of discrimination, uh, the segregation, the racism that was the dominant white post-colonial behavior. Of course, during this time, people resisted largely unsuccessfully, and whites built a military machinery and a legislative and administrative machinery that was able for many decades to oppress the majority. But there was a resistance. And the ANC, the African National Congress, one of the oldest, the oldest political party in Africa, um, uh, began in 1912 and uh, by bourgeois black South Africans wanting access, but slowly they mobilized and very interesting twist in our story is they went to Moscow for extra lessons because your enemy's enemy is your best friend and the enemy of British imperialism was the, was the, United, the Soviet Union. And so South African Jewish people who had migrated here from the pogroms were very pro the overthrow of the Tsar and they were communists and they connected black South Africans to the communist party. And this afternoon, I'm hosting some top party leaders to talk about reforming the ANC. And one of them will be in what's called the alliance. And the alliance is the unions, the communist party and the ANC have formed an alliance for many years. And so it's a strange quirk of history that we went there. We went for training, we went for ideology, and we went for material support. And um, Africans generally are not communists. We are nationalists. And of course we were anti-colonial, but, but it has a long lasting legacy because even today the leaders were trained in Moscow in Marxist Leninism. So you have a revolutionary party that still talks about the revolution, trying to manage the transformation of a fairly complex and modern state and a fairly and complex modern economy. Because South Africa has a pretty modern economy. As I said, all the multinationals are here. So <clears throat> growing up in this very discriminatory world, um, many of us joined the, 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 uh, the demand for democracy. 
And the ANC, as you know, led by people in jail and outside of jail, uh, built global support. And gradually the tide turned on this white regime and sanctions were imposed. And finally, also the domestic contestation grew. What we call the mass democratic movement challenged the state. It led massive strikes, think of Ukraine, um, and it slowly pushed the, the, the Afrikaner government into reform. They tried to reform, but always too little too late. And so the mass democratic movement uh, eventually with the ANC, uh, and it was of course linked to the ANC, took us to negotiations. The ANC was unbanned in 1990. We all wanted the immediate handover of power, but wiser minds decided we should negotiate. And so you never had a surrender of the white regime. What you had was a negotiation of asymmetric powers, a white, formidable white state with tremendous resources, very well organized, bureaucratic, legislative and administrative, and a mass democratic movement, a somewhat revolutionary movement had brought in weapons and attacked various uh, spaces. It wasn't a very violent revolution, although many people suffered and were detained and brutalized and some were assassinated, but it wasn't on a large scale uh, overthrow. It was a negotiation. Out of the negotiation came a constitution. And that constitution is regarded by many. Ruth Bader Ginsburg said in the US, this was the best constitution she knew of. It was liberal. It was very strongly based on human rights. And we have a very strong and independent judiciary. Let me talk about the people a bit more. We are a population of 60 million. We've had about 5 million mainly illegal migrants come into our borders from the rest of Africa, mainly our neighbors, but from far away as Ethiopia, which is six, 7,000 kilometers away, Nigeria, um, Bangladesh, Pakistan. Um, some uh, Chinese have been coming here. There are various layers of Chinese history here that are very interesting. So we're a very mixed society, but it's got strange features, which is everybody speaks my mother's tongue, even though for 90% of the people, it is a second or third language. We have 11 official languages. We're a constitutional democracy. We have free and fair elections. The ANC has largely stayed in power since 1994 when we had the first election where I am, the Western Cape has always been under the control of another party. So the ANC does have opposition and it lost quite a lot of big cities in the last local government election. So we are a functioning democracy. The media is free and, and open. Um, people have the right of association. They have the right to protest. Uh, we are, we are a, a limited access as uh, uh, Mr. North describes, a limited access democracy. What limited access means is your influence largely depends on your wealth and your education, uh, but we are a democracy, but we're a complex democracy. And the ANC has managed to persuade the electorate that it will reform. The economy has gone through a very tough time. It had a sort of um, a, a democracy dividend for a while, for about five or six years. You must remember now that, that we had to transform all government institutions, all state-owned enterprises and the private sector to become significantly more representative of our demography. The state has gone way beyond that. I would say it's 95% led by black officials. The state-owned enterprises, because the Afrikaners followed quite a developmental model in the 50s and built big state-owned enterprises, these have really in a very bad situation. Our biggest one, our power generator, has gone from being the most admired or in the top five in the world to being the worst. It has a massive, massive debt and we lose power in the winter maybe uh, once a day or once every two days. And the entire fiscus is hanging on the debt. We built the two biggest coal-powered fire stations in the world neither are functioning properly. So the economy is really struggling. And I'll talk more about that later. We're a mixed economy. We have a strong banking system, 
really good. It's big. Mining is recovering. In agriculture, we're very, very good, along with many other countries. We export vast quantities of fruit um, and other uh, agricultural products around the world. Um, so that's a very big sector. We have a, a modest manufacturing sector, but like the United States, the Chinese uh, had huge impact on it. But we make cars. We, we're not a high tech manufacturing uh, economy, but we're a medium tech. Uh, but we do have some very good service businesses. We have a, a medical, an HMO that's one of the best in the world, and their system of HMO, and I'll talk about it if you want to later, uh, is licensed all over the world. Um, we have uh, fast food companies, insurance businesses, some IT. So we're not a, we're different than the rest of the continent. And I want to end by saying we behave in a bit like an island, a bit like Britain and Brexit. Uh, we, we inward looking and we backward looking and we don't take too seriously, although we're a very open economy, the bulk of our population are not exposed to the dynamics of globalization, of global rivalry, of superpower behavior, um, because we are so inward looking and we are licking our wounds after 300 years of brutality. We are recovering, we are still in trauma. There's huge amounts of poverty. We have 40% unemployment. If you're a young black man in an urban area, there's a 70% chance you don't have a job. So we have a big social grant system to try and support this. It's quite small, it's run out of money. The state is in a deficit. It's uh, been dropped by the credit ratings out of a top grade into junk, almost junk grade. But we have a vibrant stock exchange, good capital formation. It's a strange and complex, contradictory country.